This last session is a very interesting one because it's one about practicing your own craft. And these folks on this panel are very successful. And I'm... <laughs> Terry. I am very pleased to introduce Mia Parrish. She's the Sue Clark Johnson Professor of Media and Innovation at the Cronkite News Center. And she was formerly the editor-in-chief of the Arizona Republic. And I could go on and on and on. She has a great bio. But she's uh, graciously agreed to moderate this panel today. And she has uh, a distinguished series of folks on the panel in a variety of areas. And they're going to talk about how they've managed to be successful in their area. So I'm going to turn it over to Mia and ask her to do her thing. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks, Paula. And I, I was actually the publisher. And I say that only because um, that would be mean to Nicole, who was the editor Fair. when I was the Sorry. publisher. No, it's all good. Um, so I'm so glad you all are here, and I like to say that I've been trying to make water sexy for 20 years. Um, and uh, so I appreciate what you all do. I uh, started uh, first covering water about 20 years ago when I was at the Arizona Republic and um, running the Sunday newspaper and doing projects and investigations, and the wonderful Sean McKinnon would turn in these fantastic projects and they would sit in the queue. Does everybody remember how that worked? Like it would sit in a queue because they'd be slugged water 0402 and then no one would touch it because once you touched it, it was yours. <laughs> um, so I started reslugging them sex 0402 and then a copy editor would be like, damn it, I got the water story, um, which was super important and really um, vital, but it's, been, it's hard, right? What you do is hard because it's so important um, and it isn't always sexy. Um, so what we're going to talk a little bit about today are successes and ways that we've helped people understand um, the importance of the topic. Um, so this is a brag session. This is, um, so I want you all to be thinking about ways that you have had success in conveying something that's so important and so vital and has actually become really pretty sexy lately. There are so many water conferences because people are tar really starting to understand how important this topic is. Um, and there are a lot of different ways, strategies, and tactics that the folks who are with me today, um, Sinjin, Elizabeth, and Cynthia, have found success in this. And then I would open up the floor and ask for you all to brag a little bit. You know, think of a time, a thing, a project that you've worked on. Um, one of the things I'm proud of is getting that Pulliam grant that helped fund the environmental coverage. And mm -hmm. if we have time, I can talk a little bit about how that came together. Um, not too long ago, but I'm going to open up, and then you guys are going to be thinking about um, bragging about your fabulousness. So maybe who would like to start? You want to, Sinjin? All right. Uh, my name is Sinjin Eberly. I'm the communications director with American Rivers, a national nonprofit river conservation organization. Um, I'm the communications director for the Colorado River Basin. And then I uh, direct or shoot, produce all of our films nationwide and manage all of our photography. So it's kind of visual media and then all things uh, Colorado Basin Communications. Um, we're, uh, like I said, a national organization. We have about 250,000 members or so, depending on how you count things. And uh, based in Washington, DC, I live in Durango, Colorado. So I have the great fortune of being seven hours from anywhere in the basin and uh, am able to be out on the road a lot, see, see a lot of these places and, and, and on the ground telling stories about what's going on across the basin and, and characters within that. So it's really an honor to be here and I appreciate the opportunity. Elizabeth. Hi, Sinjin. Um, I'm Elizabeth Hightower Allen, the features editor at Outside Magazine. And uh, first I want to thank Paula and everyone at the Abbott Center and the Lincoln for, um, for, for ha Institute for having us, um, and especially all the, the water people who may or may not still be here who have so patiently explained stuff um, to us. Um, I come from a general interest publication, so a lot of this has been a really great education for me. But um, I, too, have waded through many hours with fact checkers and writers about the law of the river and the difference between delivery and non-depletion from the upper basin to the lower basin. So I do, I do feel your pain. Um, <laughs> and as several people have said um, in, this, in this forum, and we've all remarked upon, you know, there's been a, a, lot, of, there's a lot of emotion not only around water 
in terms of our daily needs to live, but also in terms of, of how we feel on healthy rivers and how what it gives to us. I think that's where outside comes in from an outdoor recreation point of view. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we've talked about the need for storytelling to infuse all that data and all those technical tools we need and all the groundwater monitoring with the human element and, and a species element and a, you know, a ecosystem element as the, um, the tribal members and, and the environmentalists have reminded us. But um, so encouragingly on that front of storytelling, um, Outside just did some research on our digital audience and their habits. And um, overwhelmingly, they come to us for long form storytelling, which we have, we have a lot of Can stories I get an about amen the, on that one? Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot of stories about like the best 10 adventure dog breeds and how I survived this and that and jackets and, you know, the best hiking boots. But the stories that get consistently the most traffic and the most time engagement are the features. Now, I had this idea that people just fell asleep during the features, and therefore it was reflected that they were on the page for a really long time <laughs> on the website. But, uh, but there actually is a way to measure that they're awake. Um, so I, you know, for us, you know, those long form stories, and you know, sometimes we have the luxury of you know, 5,000, 6,000 words in print and even longer online, um, you know, they have all the characteristics we want to see in um, a great read, a narrative, characters that are going to say some wild <coughs> things, that are going to share how they feel inside, scenes, humor, um, in this case with water, law, absurdity, um, tragedy for people. So I know we don't really all have the luxury of that kind of word count and everything we're doing on daily water news. But um, those stories, and I have a couple examples we can talk about later, have been really effective for our readers. Um, and also the, um, the way to tell a story for us, because we're outside, um, is through a participatory narrative in, in the outdoor world and the outdoor landscape. And I think that hooks people too, because they're, you know, as Sinjin does with his films, you're there with someone going through this riparian landscape, and and that that's sometimes a lot more effective than just reading about how policy will affect that landscape. Um, I think you make a, a, an interesting point because part of what this we're talking about is the challenge of getting the resources that you need for what you do, mm -hmm. um, and it's hard sometimes. And um, there is a, a business case to be made for the kind of work that Elizabeth is talking about. So if people are engaged in the stories, you're making a case for that kind of work, the more time that they spend with you, the more money your operation is making. I mean, you can make a case for this kind of journalism, um, and it's real. You know, it's, it's valuable. And so it's, um, I think that's one way that you get at how you get those resources, too. And so well, and I, those long-form features, features can be a as we say, sexy place for an advertiser to be mm -hmm. digitally because mm -hmm. you can have one ad buy for the whole thing mm -hmm. and it can be a more elegantly designed and more mm -hmm. unobtrusive and kind of, um, you know, they, they like that because it's not so choppy. And I think this kind of work also has um, a long tail that, especially something like outside, and you're seeing that more and more even with uh, more traditional outlets and that's really valuable as well. Mm -hmm. You know, instead of just the whatever Duchess Megan uh, got married pictures or whatever, <laughs> that you get a lot of traffic, but then it goes away. But something like what you do, and it stays, and people come back to it over and over again, it's really valuable. Mm -hmm. our, so our, best, our best uh, performing feature is still a story that Peter Stark did in the 90s about freezing to death. Right, so still I've spectacular. We roll it right. out every winter. I mean, it's since yeah, people just, since it's so the fabulous. Freezing to death is. Yeah happens, you might as well make money on it. I don't know what the, don't tweet that. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, Cynthia. Well, uh, thank you everyone for having us. This has been really a wonderful couple of days for me as well. My name is Cynthia Barnett. I have been covering water for about 20 years and I started off like a lot of people here as a um, kind of a daily grind newspaper reporter covering uh, Water And what led me to write my first book, which was called Mirage, Florida and the Vanishing Water of the Eastern U.S., there's a weird story that 
water can vanish in a wet place, um, was really my frustration at the opaqueness of water management on this topic that is so emotional for people and so personal for people. So we heard this morning that water is emotional for people in the West. I can tell you it's emotional for people all over the country and all over the world. Um, and what I've really come to appreciate is the importance of hitting this sweet spot between that hard-hitting investigative data work we were talking about this morning and the emotional, often lyrical human story of water. So um, Paolo said last night he wants to see us move from what's interesting to what's important. And that sweet spot, I think, is making what's important interesting. And that's um, sort of what we all do, right? So um, the kind of the arc, the arc of my career has been that I wrote a couple of fairly wonkier water books that were more of on the side of the water wonks or the investigative or the data-driven work. And I realized with those two books, um, you know, they did well, but I found that when I would get invited to speak to people, it would be the water lawyers or the water engineers or the Audubon Society, the people who already um, <laughs> knew everything that was in my books. So, I really wanted to try to reach a broader audience. And um, so for my most recent book, which is a natural and cultural history of rain, literally from the rains that filled the oceans to the modern story of climate change, I really set out to do something completely different and write a more, um, a more lyrical book of water. And it still has, it still has all the climate data. It still has the stories about the 4,000 year ago drought and um, all the extreme rain data and so on. But it also tells stories of the, the poetry of rain and the perfume of rain. And that's been my, by far my most successful work. And um, it really seems to connect with people emotionally. So just one, one, one little story is the number of people um, who reach out to me who grew up in India who were very moved on um, this chapter I wrote about the scent of rain, which was based in India. Um, this is a long story that I won't tell now, but there's an amazing uh, aroma from the earth that comes with the monsoons. And this, there's a village in India where villagers have been capturing that scent and turning it into perfume um, for centuries. And that kind of reporting has really touched people in a way that my earlier water reporting did not. And, and again, it does, um, the data is there, the climate assessment is in there, but it's sort of um, hidden in uh, perfume and poetry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which, is, yeah. which is so lovely. Um, one of the things I love the most about the desert is what, how it smells when it rains. Ah, um, sage. And, um, it, right, it's <laughs> yeah. just lovely. And the, mm -hmm. the, um, my husband and I will say when it rains, like, come outside, come outside, and just smell the air. Like, yeah. it's just yeah. this wonder, wondrous thing. Yes. Um, so I, I love that story. Um, I, I did want to get back to you, Sinjin, because you both mentioned about audiences, and we talked a little bit about that. And, and if you could share some of your thoughts on how yeah. you approach that, because I think that has a lot to do with how we cover and reach people. Yeah, Elizabeth and Cynthia touched on it too, and of course, everybody in this room is trying to get their stories or their message or whatever out, out to as broad an audience as we possibly can. Um, when I started with American Rivers, I came out of uh, a professional career um, in marketing research, and so we were doing, we were doing consumer-facing research in hospitality and in new product development, and so uh, on, the, on the research side, which is similar to polling, but a little different, um, you're always seeking to figure out you know, why people do what they do. Why do they purchase a product? Why do they, why do they choose to stay at a Holiday Inn Express instead of a, of a La Quinta? Um, and everyone would want to stay at a residence inn, of course. But um, <laughs> you know, the, the whys behind how people make decisions and what they decide to engage in. And so I actually was um, having a conversation with a reporter from High Country News once, and we were sitting at a bar in Durango, and you know she was asking me about why it's so difficult 
to get more people to pay attention, in our case, to river issues? And why is it so difficult for the, for the public to understand you know, where their water comes from? Things like the things that are really basic that all of us deal with every day. And I, you know, I knew the bartender and I said, you know, the problem is organizations like American Rivers, and I'm not picking on ourselves just because I can, but we all are really, really good at talking to ourselves. We're really good at saying the words that are, that are in our comfort zones. And, and it's, it's a challenge, and especially when you're under-resourced and under pressure to produce things, that you, you go with it because it's what you know. And so I came up with this little theory that I believe 5% of the public naturally falls into the buckets that we're addressing here. And, and so it isn't that we need to expand our audience by 50%, but if we could just get that next 5% to pay attention. And I think you gotta, you gotta do that by trying to meet the reader or the viewer or the listener, um, whether it's words or film or podcasts, where they are and not just assume that they're gonna come to you. And so, you know, that is, that is how I try to think about audiences all the time. We just went through, you know, for, for two days we've, we've heard about the DCP, it's amazing. And I was fortunate enough to work, um, you know, some of the communications side with our coalition uh, in these DCP efforts. And it's been remarkable, but in the back of my mind, I keep going, okay, but I wanna make the people in Phoenix I want to. I want to try to help get us to the point where they understand this entire basin's got to live within a 13 million acre foot river, not a 17 million acre foot river. And at the same time, and I, I can't remember who said it yesterday, but we also want to think of the river as a river, not just as a delivery mechanism. Mm -hmm. So how do we start meeting people here when you know? Is it 40 percent of all the water that comes into Phoenix comes from the CAP Canal? It's literally a delivery mechanism. And so, you know, how do we inspire those stories? And I'm do I'm increasingly doing it through film, just because that visual media is so much more catching. It works well online, doesn't take as much time, and if you can grab somebody, they're going to watch it, and it's and it's pretty cool. Um, so that's my theory on audience, and I'm always trying to push to how do I get into that next 5% of people that hopefully I can meet them in a language where they're thinking about it and, and then they'll pay attention to what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, we did want this to be a conversation and, and that's not just questions but you know you sharing. Um, so if there are people who want to like start talking about that, I, I wanted um, a well actually both of you talked about this, but Elizabeth in particular, you were talking about um, the nature of social media and how that has, um, transformed uh, coverage of water over time as well. You were talking about Instagram and Twitter too. So I think. Yeah, I think you'll see this. Um, a lot of photographers do a good job with this of doing almost a, a really arresting image on in Instagram and then sort of a, a mini essay as a caption. You're seeing that more and more. And um, I think it's a, and it's, it's, you know, I think we tend to, um, Twitter seems to be more about kind of talking, you know, among. Newsmakers. Preaching to the choir. Uh, well, just, you know, <laughs> really great information sharing among newsmakers and everything, but, um, and, uh, and breaking news. But I think for affecting readers, we usually have seen a lot of engagement with Instagram and a little, uh, you know, Facebook, which is changing. But um, I think that's kind of a way also to, to lure someone into a longer, or bigger, or maybe a denser story, you know, by, by posting. Mm -hmm. um, Something that really can affect people in the heart and and outside of the the brain. Here I am at my desk absorbing information that I almost can't process. Which different audiences are you seeing moved by different medium and um, uh, channels? And I would say, I mean, you know, obviously younger audiences with mm -hmm. the um, the social media. We have now a whole social media answer. team. Thank you. We have, um, <laughs> but. Um, yeah, we're, we're just kind of reaching out in all ways and being gratified that our readers are interested, whether it's through social media or film, in kind of the meaty, really great stories about people they can be inspired by or issues or something really entertaining as opposed to short clicks. Yeah, I don't want to jump on Cynthia, but the, the thing that it, with film, when we started our film program about five years ago, the thing that we strove to do was we want to be able to make festival quality films. 
and I want to be able to make repeated festival quality films year over year. And what and, and the reason behind that is then I go to a film festival, we show a film to a, an audience of 80 or 200 or 500, whatever it is, and then you stand on stage and that's your opportunity to talk about the issue, right? I wowed you with this beautiful emotional story of a father and son going down the Grand Canyon, the important places, if you haven't seen it, you need to. Uh, <laughs> And, it's fantastic. But you can, you can stand on stage and talk about the Grand Canyon then. You know, at that time, we were in the issues of the proposal to build the tram and the proposal of Tucson to potentially take more water off the south rim of the Grand Canyon. And, and then, of course, uranium mining. It said none of that in the film. There is zero words about any of those things in the film. But that was a vehicle to get us into a different audience where I could then talk about that. And that film has had you know, a couple million views. We made a film about Paul Bruche a couple of years ago. Um, and so being able to have an ag producer tell the story of his family isn't anything about ILVK, isn't anything about, I mean, there's a little bit in there about raising the river for his uh, agricultural operations, but um, you know, it's really an opportunity then for him to be featured at settings like this and you show the film and then he talks about it and he's, he's addressing an entirely new audience. Well, I'll, I guess I'll try to add a different angle to audience. Um, when I think about, I, I really think about the audience I'm writing for, and I have this idea in my mind of an audience called the caring middle. So these are the people in the middle. They're not the super knowledgeable water people. And um, you, some of you know the work of the Yale Climate Communications Program, they have this spectrum of global warming six, America, six Americas. So we know that 21% of Americans are alarmed. This is the most recent year, and this, this number has been growing. 21% are alarmed. This group probably knows a lot. It's probably the more water literate group, too. Then there's 9% on the other end who are called dismissive. These might be um, climate deniers. And so it's OK to ignore those two extremes, because you aren't really going to convince one side, and the other side understands really well. And so I try to think about this large group in the middle, um, the caring middle. And I think a, a way of reaching this group that I think is relatively new for journalists, particularly print journalists, are that we are you know, more, more often going out into our communities and engaging with people about our stories. So I know um, Ian James does this sometimes. Does, is this um, part of your newspaper company's policy, or is this something that you do on your own? Sorry to ask you a question from the stage, but <laughs> no, no, maybe actually, I can, that's get, what the, we're maybe on I can get the dialogue going <laughs> come on. Sh come share. And yeah. while you're coming up, I'll just tell you this quick story. This is not something I ever did before I started writing books and got invited places. And I never like to speak in public. I really like to be behind the notebook. But that kind of forced me to get out and engage with audiences. And now I find myself um, talking to a lot of middle America type people. I actually speak in a lot of churches for some reason. Uh, my second book has been, um, there's, a, there's a biblical guide to my second book, Blue Revolution, which was really shocking to me, but there are large church communities all over the country that are very interested in working on water as a matter of faith. And so that, I think, is really helpful in getting us out into the communities and getting our audiences to engage in our work. Thank you, Ian, for telling us. Um, yeah, if, I was just curious if that's your newspaper policy or it's something you've done on your own. It's both, and um, I wanted to say also that your work is an inspiration, and I, I think that's really helpful that you get out there and connect with people in that way. It is a policy of our newspaper and of Gannett in general to have these community e events, and so I have been doing more speaking than I used to, mm -hmm. and I've been learning about it. And actually next Friday in Palm Springs, we're going to be having a forum focusing on uh, 
uh, pollution issues along the border and what can be done about them. Mm -hmm. So part of the idea is after we publish an investigation to hold an event where we talk about some of the potential solutions and explore these ideas together. That's great. So it, it also goes back to that conversation we were having about the importance of local environmental journalism and how crucial that is mm -hmm. and sort of how we keep that vital. And it is much better than it was 20 years ago. And um, we, we should celebrate that, um, but really keep trying to keep it alive. And so having local journalists go out into the community and talk about their work helps build trust Right, and then that helps build your subscription base, your readership, and I think it also, um, when once you have an audience's trust, it becomes easier to say things about climate change. You know, a couple of people over the past few days have said that they don't say those words, and um, you know, that's that's something hard for us to comprehend as journalists that we would try to avoid. Um, such a funda fundamental truth. But if I've found that the more I'm out in communities, um, the more I'm able to speak difficult truths. And I, th I think it's also one more avenue for having storytelling be a two-way street yeah. where uh, we are not only collecting the information and putting it out there in some way or telling stories, but hearing those stories as well. And we do have a series called The Storytellers Project that involves uh, first-person storytelling. And actually, mm -hmm. cool. at, at our last uh, gathering at the 10X, someone came up afterward, a professor from ASU, and was suggesting, uh, why not do my story about water, where people That's could stand mm -hmm. up and, mm -hmm. yeah. Thank so, you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, the, the Storytellers Project started here, and part of the reason it, it um, was launched was uh, it's maybe seven years ago. Um, because we were seeing this coarsening of dialogue and this beginning of the disconnection in the audiences um, and disconnection with the local people. And we felt like if we had our journalists telling stories but also invited our readers and, and community members to tell their own stories and teach them how to tell stories, um, that we would, we would be more connected. And that was a, sort of a source of positivity and truth and authenticity. And, and kick that off with the centennial, so that would have been in 12, um, here, and now it's gone national, and now it's on specific topics, you know, we've really, they've used that to um, accelerate conversations that are more complicated, but also are simple, right, or like around water, which I think is fantastic, so you should do that. Um, who else do we have to share who's, who's had some success or a challenge, or, um, or, and I'm gonna start picking on people I recognize if no one comes up, so like. <laughs> Brandon, don't be surprised if you have to come up and say something. <laughs> Jim on. Bruggers, what was it like being yeah. in The New Yorker? <laughs> You've we, become famous in the past few days. May I exit now? <laughs> <laughs> come on. So Jim, Jim was one of the reporters um, written about in the, in the New Yorker piece that many of you have probably read. and. I put it on Twitter with our hashtag this morning. So, and if you have if you haven't read the if you haven't read the story, you can certainly read the I don't know three thousand tweets that it generated. <laughs> so um, the positive is is that I think I've gained maybe uh, sixty Twitter followers this week. So, um, um, I, you know that it's uh, at the at the core of the New Yorker story is the fact that I worked, I was the last full-time environment reporter, not only in Kentucky, but it was at a very important uh, journalistic institution, the Louisville Courier Journal. It's one of the first newspapers to have a full-time environment reporter. They covered environment in depth and, um, and quite extensively, even in the 50s, with sewer prob sewage problems and air pollution problems. I mean, it's a city that they used to measure air pollution with buckets and yardsticks. So how much soot, you know, like accumulated in the bottom of a, of a bucket overnight or over the week. So anyway, you know, that, that was what they, I mean, I don't, know, I don't know how they got out of the story. I don't know why they came to Kentucky. But, uh, um, but anyway, uh, anybody that's been with newspapers knows it's been a rough uh, decade in particular. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, I just, I found another job. I, I, 
I wasn't laid off. I, I feel fortunate that I'm now working for Inside Climate News, where I'm attempting to not only cover the Southeast, um, but also uh, mentor younger journalists and work on collaborations. But it was a really weird, it's been a really, really weird week. I mean, I've had <laughs> people that I thought were friends um, who are journalists in the area that, that uh, you know, I would run into them <laughs> like on Tuesday and they were hostile. As oh. if it was like I somehow wrote the story myself, which I didn't. Um, so I'm not going to criticize the story or make and I'm not going to. Anybody that wants to kind of go through that can just look at those tweets, and you can read the read the article, read the tweets, see what you think. But yeah, it was a really weird week. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? Do we have other? Well, yeah, just, come well, on, come on up, and tell us something. Well, I was going to say while well, Tony's coming up, that I'm really grateful for for people like Tony and and Ian James and other people who have been reporting. I mean, DCP just by way of example, but there's so many other stories out there that, that are important. And so for, a, for an advocacy organization like ours, being able to, to see the information go out there and pivot off of it to tell the story about, in my case, what is American Rivers doing on this? How are we working on these issues from the uh, conservation community, from the NGO community? And, and so the, the platform of the information that, that you all get out is enormously valuable for us to be able to then push out to our members nationwide. I mean, um, I, two years ago when we entered into uh, some of the campaign that we've been talking about all day today and yesterday, we only had, you know, three or 4,000 members in Arizona. And because we've been continuously putting the information out there and linking to other sources of information that are really, really good, we're at like 9,000, which is not a lot of people in Arizona, I get, um, but, uh, the ability to have credible, knowledgeable reporting on things that are really important to everybody, and then we put our own, here's what we're doing spin on it, um, is extraordinarily valuable. So thanks to all you guys that have been doing this. Yeah, I'll, I'll second that, and I'm sorry, Tony, just a quick, <laughs> just a quick second to that. Since Jim wouldn't criticize the New Yorker story, I will. <laughs> I'll just I'll just give the little bit of a take which you could read Greg Burton's 40 wonderful tweets on it but essentially it left out this part of the story the part of the story that's in this room right the power of environmental journalism growing over the past 20 years or so um, SEJ started with a few members right 25 years ago 1990, and, uh, 1990, and today we have 1,400 members. It's a very strong organization, and there's a lot going on that is important to talk about, such as the polium. It's great to hear that you were <laughs> behind that. Um, uh, it's a, uh, and I'll tell the backstory, but that, after that after funding. Time. So um, you know the the fact that we have reporters like Ian funded at the Arizona Republic with this um, you know, unique philanthropic model, and there are many others we could talk about, and the terrific ProPublica models. Those were all some of the things that people wish had been in the New Yorker article, um, which did raise important points as well. Sorry, Tony. Well, that's, <laughs> no, I'd much rather listen to you, but I, I, on the New Yorker article, I'm neither gonna praise nor criticize it, because I had mixed reactions to it. Me too. But yeah. what I will say is that the reaction from journalists to this article just overwhelms me in this sense, that for decades I have been besieged by criticism from business communities, sometimes environmentalists, from government. Why don't you write about anything positive? And now journalists are doing the same thing. And I just, that just kind of blew me away, even though I think some of the criticisms <laughs> were valid. You know, yeah. what process did they go through to produce that story? Was it the reporter's fault that nothing positive was mentioned, or did the editor, did Remnick himself decide, <laughs> you know, that's just, that, that's just getting in the way of the narrative here. The narrative is really powerful, whatever, you know? And so that's just a point I want to make. I want to talk more about the substance of what we're talking about here with water. Sometime in about 2017, maybe, 2018, I started hammering at the drought contingency plan and the war between the CAP and the DWR full time. And I spent more time on Twitter tweeting other stories on water. 
and my Twitter feed in the beginning of last year was 1,500, and now it's just today hit 3,400. And some of that is the Rosemont Mine, which I presume some of you are familiar with and maybe some aren't. But water is 90% of it. Um, the, the events of, I don't know exactly when, when the line was crossed here, but the events of the last five years, since maybe 2014, the Miracle May, the back and forth, the DCP, has really elevated this as a public issue in the eyes of residents. So I've actually been asked to go speak on it at a bunch of places you know, and places, and they're not like, they're not environmental groups, you know, and it was the Saddlebrook Community Nature Club, and it was a bunch of, it was a book club that met out at a library out on the east side, and this sort of thing. Um, so the most important thing we need to tell our editors is that water really resonates with people in Arizona right now. And I've been doing this for 35 years, and I've never seen anything like this. People are at their wit's end. They don't know what to do. I'm sorry. But, you know, I've been watching this build. So, yeah, there's a story out there, and there's a market. Yes. And sometimes we have to sell our editors. It's interesting that you, tell, that you said, Cynthia, that 3,500-word stories that are with a lot of heart are what are selling. Because in a newspaper, you could never get something like that in now. There used to be a time when you could. But most of the time, you can't. It would, then the story would have to double jump, and readers don't want to read double jumps. And readers don't read past the first 10 paragraphs anyway. But what you're doing is really good. And I hope that you figure out a way to market that and raise the consciousness of other editors and other journalists around the country so it can be replicated more. All right? Um, I'm, I don't have time to write magazine articles, but even if I did, I wouldn't have the space. And I admire what you're doing, and the same goes for Cynthia. You, you found a way to really reach people, but even in Arizona, I'm kind of babbling now, even with that, the story has taken off. And really, that's all I want to say. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Yes, thank sorry, you. thank you for that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, thank you. Um, I can speak as an editor on the selling our editors mm -hmm. on that. Um, I have two, two anecdotes along those lines. One um, came about as a, a really, a dry sort of sense in our office that we have to cover the Colorado River. It was like in 2013 or 2012, and we need to do more. We'd obviously done some stories, and I heard from someone at the Walton Foundation about this pulse flow, and then Ann Castle happened to come through Santa Fe and meet with us at Outside, and we talked about the structural deficit and this and that, and and at the time she was the Undersecretary of Interior, and we talked about different ways and. You know, for our magazine, we really, we really wanted something that wouldn't be a more Smithsonian or National Geographic take on a large issue. Um, so, of course, poor Anne sitting there, and we were saying, well, when the pulse flow comes, will it be like a giant tsunami <laughs> that we could ride? You know, and she was like, who are you people? <laughs> But in the end, we sent Rowan Jacobson, who's uh, right uh, in the middle there, who's a wonderful, uh, really versatile and entertaining writer on food and, and the environment. Um, we sent him down with, with Jennifer Pitt and a bunch of people into Morales Dam, and he was on his paddleboard, uh, his canoe, actually, for the pulse flow with, with Pete McBride and um, Sam Walton. And we did, it was a really great visceral way for us to show that. Now, I don't know whether locally you'd go paddleboard the entire CAP or whether you even could, but, you know, there was a, um, that was a very, we started with a really dry topic, and we had to kind of cast about until we saw um, a way to engage readers as, a, as an experience. Um, the second one was the Lake Powell pipeline. Um, in 2018, we started hearing about uh, St. George's, Utah's plans to um, bring 86,000 acre feet from Lake Powell to St. George. And um, we sent uh, Mark Sundin, who's a, a great long form writer who's been um, with, uh, he's written a number of books, and he's just got a lot of voice and he's got a point of view. And we sent him to St. George, and um, I think, uh, you know, this pipeline, it's kind of on hold now, but it was going to go 140 miles and cost upwards of a billion dollars. 
there were a lot of public record comments from the water administrators of St. George and from, say, Mike Knoll, the Utah state legislator. And uh, he drove along the route. And I think, um, as, as Kathy Jacobs said earlier, the story kind of allowed people to take their hats off and to experience um, what it was like up there. And the, the temptation was to, to demonize you know, these retirees with their golf courses and their water slides wanting even more water. And that, you know, of course, came right through. But, you know, Mark, and as an editor, it's very, you have to really watch because he was having a lot of fun writing about that side of it. And, but he, everyone became very human, very sympathetic, even Mike Knoll, who when Mark had a very personal tragedy after the story, wrote him a really long, beautiful letter about the importance of life and children and water and, you know, very heart, a very affecting thing. So, um, but Mark was also able to, to show um, in that a very also hot button issue, which is the tribes and their, as we've all been so engaged with today, this idea that we do, don't have a sit, seat at the table. And through this sort of absurd June journey through water slide St. George, Mark ended up going out to the Kaibab Indian Reservation where their uh, pipe springs flow has gone from 50 gallons a minute to five. And the pipeline is going to go right past them. But it's going to be, because it's a Utah project, and they're in the Arizona Strip, that pipeline's going to drive right through, go, roll right through their town if it's ever built without them getting a drop of water. So it just, uh, you know, it really, he was able to really, through this very personal story, um, show that. And to also show that of the like 8,000 Navajo living in Utah, only uh, I think only 3,000, no, more than 3,000 do not have running water. So, you know, he's got a line again in the piece, which is like, let me say that again. In 2018, American citizens do not have running water in their homes. So, you know, not every newspaper or um, local, you know, or nonprofit funded journalism can have that point of view that just cuts through the bureaucracy. But, you know, if, you're, if you take a really dry subject and then go out from there on the ground, it becomes a lot more compelling. And that's sort of where we've started when we have a, a topic like pipeline. Well, in that, ex those two examples, I mean, I, I've helped IJNR put together a couple of their IJNR tours. Mm -hmm. And one that went around Arizona. Brandon, did you go on the Arizona? The, yeah, Colorado River in Arizona one, there was one in the upper basin, there was one in Alaska, I didn't help with that. Um, but, you know, the, the ability to get people out in the field in these remote places and see what's going on on the ground, not, you know, the, the reporting of things is great, but the experience of being out there for extended periods of time, mm -hmm. if you aren't familiar with those things, is really awesome. One of the best parts of my job, and it's the reason why I said, I mentioned at the beginning that I'm from Durango, the center of all of it, is. I, we actively take journalists out to remote places and show them, you know, this is what's going on and this is what we're doing. A number of years ago, a couple journalists and I paddled the length of Lake Powell, which in, in sea kayaks, which sounds fairly awesome, except that it was in December. And so it was really cold all the time. Uh, Heather Hansman and I and, and Russ uh, descended a very remote canyon last year in Colorado that is just 48 hour street fight going down this canyon. Um, but you know, the great stories that come out of that and seeing these places uh, is remarkable. And it's one of the things, one of the ways I really, really, really want to get the stories out there is getting people into places like that and making them suffer a little bit. Right, Heather? <laughs> well, it can also take it away from the, um, the partisan divide because you know you meet people on a level where they have universal concerns and universal appeal as humans and universal suffering in the in your kayak. And so for us, it's Ty been too fun is the best story. Yeah, yeah, yeah we're yeah. not a political uh, magazine. Yeah. We don't cover politics really, so it's it's a, a great way to get into aspects of politics without the back and forth talking head. Yeah. yeah, we do a number of river trips a year too, where we get journalists on there. We get policy. Ann Castle's been on one of our trips. Uh, I think we've invited Jim Lockhead, but he hasn't made it yet. 
um, and a number of journalists who have been on these trips, and it's super valuable. You know, everybody, to be a little crass, everybody's pooping in the same bucket. You, the barriers get broken down pretty quickly once once you're out there for a few days. Yeah, if you tweet that, quote him. So, anyway. <laughs> uh, do we have others that wanted to share, Heather, about um, the trip, perhaps, or other things, or or not? Nah. Yeah, that's like that's. It's interesting as you, as you Just come a, up here. A, as, a, as a commercial break, Heather Hansman has a new book out that Ooh. everyone should buy. Congratulations. Okay, congratulations. <laughs> um, I have copies if anybody wants to see it. But um, when you were saying that, I was thinking a lot, and I've been thinking today and over the past couple of days, kind of about what stories we pay attention to and kind of what we as a freelancer, so I'm kind of always looking for the hook and trying to figure out what to pitch. And a lot of times I think those like, a river sort of like an easy thing to write about because there's a pretty clear narrative. You can kind of follow it and tell the story. But something like groundwater or something like how do the tribes get to the table, that's a harder story to kind of like quantify and pitch. And I think what you guys, like Tony, does at Daily News is a pretty different thing. Like you can kind of get into that nitty gritty, but the telling those stories about the less sexy things is a tricky thing for me. So that's been interesting to kind of try and peel out of this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't know if other people have ideas about how to what is ground water? Find that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I was kind of liking the double entendre of the practicing the craft because what you're doing is sort of magical, right? Like you're figuring out the magic and the poetry yeah. and the religion that sits within this story that so many people think is dry but is so important. Yeah, um, and it's um, and emotional, right? So I appreciate your heart for yeah. for the craft because it, I, I think it does take that. And we're hearing that sort of storytelling aspect and. and um, and the emotion that comes mm -hmm. within it. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to acknowledge that as well. But yeah. you were next sharing <laughs> what you got. Sharing what you got. Um, does that? Is there anyone here who's not familiar with the term um, Zanjaro? Is there anyone here who doesn't know what that is? So you know, it's the water masters who brought life to the desert because they were the ones who would draw off the canals. And um, I don't know how many of you know the the governor. Um, Governor Ducey, he, his business ambassadors are called the Zanjaros because of the idea that their economic development brings life to the desert, um, that which to me means nowadays people under, are more and more understanding the economics of that and how important it is. Um, and that even peop, you know, when you're talking about the politi politicization or politicization, I can't mm -hmm. even think of the politicization, the politicization of, of water, but um, the money, the money behind it, the business and economic imperatives of it are making that sexy now too. So when you ask about that, like groundwater is sexy because it's freaking going to drive the economy. It's really, really important. And so we're we're seeing the, that narrative um, shift as well. So the things that you all have been covering for so long, that's another way that I've seen um, the ability to make a case for why that needs to be covered. So as we're talking about that, I think that's really important to acknowledge. Well, um, and no, and no. No criticism about any of it, but certainly groundwater has suddenly become really interesting again because yeah. of the Pinal County situation, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, everybody was talking about the Groundwater Management Act again. And all of a sudden, it was like, whoa, this isn't just what are we doing with the Colorado River and the fight between CAP and ADWR? It was good grief. We may have to dip back into this thing that a lot of people, unfortunately, probably haven't had to think about much because there was management, because there was a good act mm -hmm. in place. And now we're going to get to explain that all over again. And here's how this thing works. And if it doesn't work, it takes decades to fix. It's a freaking disaster. Um, and that's a, it's a really good um, point. Um, everything that's old is new again. You guys have been, a lot of you have been doing this for a long time. And you're like, I wrote about groundwater over <laughs> and over and over and over again. And people didn't listen or like seven people read it. But um, I would just encourage you as well. I think that's part of the magic in the practicing of the craft is that you have this knowledge that is so extensive and you have the battle scars from it, but you know, like open up those file cabinets again because they co they're coming back up, they are resurfacing, whether it's groundwater or these other aspects of it. Um, they, their time has come, a lot of these stories, their time has come, which I think is really important to remember too. I really appreciate Heather's question about how to write about groundwater because it is <laughs> invisible. And it's so difficult. And I was just thinking about the ways I've written about groundwater that were most impactful. This one, this one um, episode is coming to mind 
Um, there, are, there are really big springs in Florida that have gone completely dry. These are springs where um, in the mid 20th century, people would dive into them from high dives and they would just be these great community gathering places with uh, dance floors and hamburger stands. And there's a dry, there's a dry one. Um, it's, it's just a huge bed of weeds in central Florida. And I hiked through that dry spring bed with elderly Floridians who had dived into it into their, in their youth. And it was so moving. Um, I was with this little old lady with very veiny arms, and I'll just never forget her holding her arms and saying she felt the goosebumps, because these are cold springs. She felt the goosebumps remembering what that felt like when she was a child in the 1940s. It had dried up due to um, a phosphate mine. And so anytime you can connect, again, connect emotionally, it is definitely a wonky story that involves pumps and pipes. But um, if you can find that person, <laughs> um, if you can find that person to, to tell the story, I think mm -hmm. that's how to pitch these stories. And I, it reminds me of a story I liked um, that I'm sure all of you read, Noah Gallagher Shannon's New York Times Magazine piece, The Water Wars of Arizona. It was such a granular piece in focusing on a family, right? Um, focusing on that main family who had moved all the way across the country to live in their dream home. And now I think it was maybe the first day they were in their new trailer, um, the, the water started turning color and then went dry. So those kinds of stories where you can be with human beings um, in, in a vanishing, a place of vanishing water, I think, are maybe a super powerful way to write mm -hmm. about groundwater. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought up the Florida example because we talk a lot at, in the West, it's really um, water, 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 it's really important, but it's not just a Western issue. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm glad Brandon's coming up because he's been, he's been doing this longer than I have. <laughs> but um, uh, when I was in Kansas, you know, you don't oh, think of yeah. Kansas as a water story, but you know, the groundwater issues and mm -hmm. with the aquifer and yeah. those stories that are you can't see, it's so important that you know mm -hmm. how you all are telling those because some of those resources now are gone forever. Mm -hmm. And if you're not mm -hmm. telling them, then that's um, well, it's a disaster, it's a nightmare. Cool. But um, tell us, what have you got? Hi, it's good to see you. Hello, <laughs> <laughs> sorry, uh, I'm just wondering what people might think of this uh, thought that occurred to me last night as I was reading the, the, the tweets about <laughs> the state of environmental journalism and how much we're investing in it and sort of the rebuttal to the, I haven't read the article, but I read the tweets. Um, <laughs> I guess that's the way things go now, right? <laughs> you know, it works. It's however you got the information. Like. But, um, you know, it, it occurred to me that, um, I mean, I think environmental journalism and water journalism has evolved and is much better than when I started at it. And we're better at telling the stories and using people to show that it's a human story. Um, but I, I wonder if what's happened that's been bad to our media, you know, the fracturing of the media landscape and the fact that people have to, people find their own news now rather than just opening the newspaper, whether that might actually have been good for for what we do in environmental journalism, as opposed to police reporting or what have you, it seems that people want this kind of news, and that there's that when it's up to them to seek it out, they're finding it. And my experience has been the same as what you described it outside. That the longer um, uh, narrative stories are the ones that get the engagement. It's almost as if the more time I put into a story, the, the more payoff there will be. And editors can see that, so yeah. they leave you alone and let you do it, you know. Well, I, if they can, yeah. I think the ProPublica piece, Killing the Colorado, a few years ago was the thing that opened my, you know, opened my eyes to this is a, a changing thing, because we were hearing about decline of media, decline of media, decline of media, and then that hit, and it was like, wow, this is this really big, expansive piece. And now there's been a lot of them, and there's entire websites built on that model, right? So ProPublica, or, and I'm not a media expert. I'm just a guy who hopes to use it. But um, Water Deeply. Please just pay for it, too. Now the, I'm just going to put a pitch in for that. I was subscribe. talking to Jason earlier about like subscribing to the Colorado Sun today. Okay, good. 
Um, you know, the water desk, uh, SEJ, IJNR, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of effort going into expanding really good holistic storytelling and it's awesome to watch and be part of. Um, to Brandon, you were talking a little bit about um, whether it's good or bad what's gone on and um, I think there, are, I've touched on this a little bit, I hope you've heard me say, I mean, I think there are some good things that are coming out of this. I think, you know, the tragedy and, and the frustration that you've suffered through all these years and trying to get people to read this and now you're finally seeing people who care and there are different ways, like that's sort of the silver lining in it. Um, I don't know how much the, the Pulliam grant, I can talk a little bit about that because I think it is interesting in how that came together and I think that is yeah. that the awfulness, um, the Pulliam grant was sort of re resulted um, from some of the awfulness. One of the, the backstory behind that is um, uh, the Arizona Community Foundation, which is one of the largest community foundations in the country, um, they came to the Arizona Republic, I guess it's almost four years ago now, um, uh, really concerned about child welfare and foster care, and seeing that as something, another unsexy but super important story, Arizona had the highest rate of children in foster care. They had 19,000 children in foster care, absolute tragedy, um, and it just kept increasing, right? And that was another thing that was just not something that we, were, we could afford to cover in the way you know, we'd covered it and covered it. But um, they came to us and said, what if we helped fund this? Is there some way that we can do this? Is there some way that we can just like blind cover the cost of the reporters and the documentarians and, and others? And we put together a project, a proposal for them um, that was a three-year grant uh, to cover foster care. And, and their agreement was that they even if their funders were mad, the governor got mad at them, whoever got mad at them, they were just gonna like deal. And um, which God bless him, is, if you ever see Steve Sells now, just like he's a mensch and he's mm -hmm. a, a blessing in my life. But um, anyway, they, we put that together and that helped fund um, numerous journalists and uh, a data project and lots of other things. And they're now, I think, under 14,000 children in foster care four years later. It's amazing, it's an incredible thing, and the governor focused a lot, as his wife um, focused on foster care as one of her pillars. Um, but one of the outcomes of that was the Pulliam Foundation came to us and said, hmm, and I don't know how much you know about the Pulliam Foundation, but it, it was, it's funded by someone who used to own the Arizona Republic, and they had never covered journalism. They'd never funded anything having to do with journalism. And um, they have millions and millions of dollars. And uh, they, they focus on the environment and, and uh, uh, pets and something else. I can't remember, I should know. But, um, but came to us and said, could we do something like the thing that the ACF did? And we were like, uh-huh, yep, mm -hmm. yep, you can, and this is how we're gonna do it. Um, and they um, did the exact same thing, and they also did it in, in Indianapolis, which I'm sure many of you know. But um, one of the, the morals of that story, you know, it sort of accelerated the goodness, right? And so we've gone out and told that story, I've gone out and told that story. Um, and I think that is a way for really important unsexy topics to, to get covered. Um, and they're, both of those foundations are now also very proud of the work that they've done because they have had this incredible impact. And I don't think, um, not that I wanted the crisis, but I think the crisis helped make those things happen, right? They were like, dear God, these things aren't getting covered and they're so important and how can we affect change and how can we um, accelerate change? And the, and the environment was something that that the Pulliams had been pouring money into in other ways, an Audubon Society thing, and I don't even know what other things they funded, but um, they, they came to realize that the coverage was so important and they needed to support the journalism to make that happen. So I don't know if you all knew that, but it's, yeah, and hopefully they'll just keep funding it. That would be really good. Well, I think, I think that's really important because some of these other startups that are so good that we all read, like Circle of Blue, um, you mentioned Water Deeply, I think they are read by the, that 21% who's already alarmed or already mm -hmm. knows a lot. And we, um, the local journalism, the local newspaper is still so important for that accountability piece. Mm -hmm. and, um, they, and they understood the audiences that could yeah. be reached through that. Yes, exactly. I mean, you go, they, they understood yeah. going to the Arizona Republic was 109 newspapers in USA Today across mm -hmm. a network of, mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. communities that were in between. And that right. was another thing that was really important to them, yeah. was being able to touch people who weren't on either coast. Mm -hmm. And so that is a good way to pitch to the others, too. Anyway. <clears throat> yeah, all that stuff is really great. Um, I am curious how many, how many newspapers the Pulliam 
is actually funding. I thought it was two. Two. Yep. Two. Mm -hmm. um, so you just made the point about it's the loss of local news mm -hmm. and it's the loss of the capacity of a newspaper to mm -hmm. deal with, mm -hmm. to cover its own community. So just the newspaper I worked at, um, I was hired there in December 27th, 1999, I left last year, went from like 260 newsroom employees to about 55. Entire departments were shed, the business department, for example. Um, we used to have great religion reporting, faith and religion, gone, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. So the question is, is what's make, what is making that up? And ProPublica certainly is doing, making headway. Mm -hmm. um, in its own way, Inside Climate News is starting to try to figure out how to deal with that, which is great. Um, but, and, and there's these public radio partnerships that are Harvest, Harvest Media, in my area, Ohio Valley Resource, which is really good. Mm -hmm. um, but if, I don't think that if you go to states like Kentucky, where, you know, right now, I still think there's only one full-time environmental journalist working. Now, there's some people that, with, with, that are with Ohio Valley Resource that dedicate part of their time to environmental subjects. But I still think there's, there's many, many communities across this, across this country that are not benefiting from the positive trends that you're identifying about, you know, Circle the Blue and some other stuff on that local level. And you can't replace easily the power of, you know, of the big, of, of a regional newspaper in a state like mm -hmm. Kentucky or well, Indiana. We know, so. I, I know of three, I mean, Al Mountain Town News, Aspen Journalism, uh, and then Laura's over there somewhere, so New Mexico environment reporter. I still can't see her, but she's waiting. But Jim, you're right. I mean, whenever um, if there are any philanthropists in the room left, <laughs> this is a really important piece of what needs to happen are not just the startups. I mean, environmental journalism is a big tent, and that's great. Um, but in addition to these new ways of telling environmental mm -hmm. stories, we need to um, salvage the traditional ways in local communities because your work, by the way, one of your stories appeared on the front page of my local newspaper, which was so cool, the Hurricane Matthew flood maps, which was terrific. But normally, when you write a story about Florida, it doesn't put pressure on Florida lawmakers in the way yeah. if the Tampa Bay Times does a story about Florida, they're talking about it in the Capitol the next day. And that is really important to the accountability side. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, yeah, I would agree. And and Ian's journalism, for example, that's funded by the Pulliam um, Grant, is seen in other places besides here, which is a great thing. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a reason Pulliam Grant's in just in those two places. So, um, yeah. But yes, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> So my name's Laura Pascas. I work for a New Mexico political report. I started my career in journalism at High Country News and have worked in radio and public TV and freelance for a long time. And about two years ago, I was hired by New Mexico Political Report, which is a nonprofit, super small media outlet in New Mexico. And basically when they hired me, they were like, environment, we, like, we recognize this as an important beat and we also recognize nobody's ever going to read your stories, but we're going to, you know, we've got That's this political true. reporting. Well, no, this is the thing, right? So they kind of like recognized that it was an important beat with the understanding of like, we're not expecting you to drive a lot of traffic. And within a few months of working there, like my stories consistently beat out everybody else's stories. Yay. And we yeah. have this, yeah. Woo, well, Laura. yeah, because I think, you know, we have, a, we have a really interesting model too, is that we have partners across the state. And so as newspapers in New Mexico have just been gutted, like sliced in the gut and left to bleed and die. Um, Wait, I mean, is, it, is this the water knife again? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we offer our stories to partners across the state. And so, you know, I have a, the Carlsbad Current Argus that picks up stories on energy and the Deming Headlight picks up stories on water. And I think that we really, in a lot of ways, like we sell ourselves short. These stories are fucking sexy. Mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> rivers drying, reservoirs mm -hmm. drying yeah, up. I mean, people's <laughs> lives and livelihoods. I mean, I think this sort of mentality of like, everything is 
journalism is dying and everything is hard and terrible. Like, we write some of the sexiest stories in the country and people mm -hmm. want to read them. And I think sort of like empowering ourselves to be like, we do really important, interesting, good work that people want to know about is really important. Mm -hmm. So I am so happy to see like so many of like my heroes in the room today. And I just think like local environmental journalism is so important and awesome. And yeah. I think y'all should be really proud of yourselves. Yeah. Well, I have, a, I have a, a very short fun fact, and I think, Laura, you know this, but I started my career in Albuquerque. I came out of school and I started my career in Albuquerque at Sandia National Laboratories. And the environment or drama reporter for the Albuquerque Journal was John Fleck, and who's now John Fleck doing all of his Fleckness show. <laughs> well, I was just going to say that. Um, that for those local environmental papers, you know, that's something that can harness a really powerful public resource, which is anger. You know, if, if the local Florida paper was like phosphite mine mm -hmm. sucks water out of beloved Cold Springs, you know, local local citizens, you know, that's one of the, the resources. I think as, as we have to be so um, objective about, I'm going to quote this person on this side and this person on the other side, you know, maybe sometimes um, we um, minimize that, that public power that we wield by getting people mad on, for good reason. I don't, know, I don't know if Laura broke this or not, but just recently the PFAS issue at the Air Force bases, did you do that? Way to go. Well, now, you know, there's, there's stories now in Colorado Springs papers about the same kind of pollution at the Air Force Base there. And it's like you broke one thing and then people glommed onto it. Like, wow, well, we have problems at Air Force Bases in Montana. OK, that's a problem. Tom, could I say a really quick thing about John Fleck? <laughs> I just don't, I don't want to forget this point about John Fleck. Another important thing about local journalism and Fleck, fleckiness, <laughs> is this, um, you know, Fleck was at the Albuquerque Journal for years, and I've been amazed at the number of people in New Mexico, water people, who have told me over the years that he was a big part of changing the ethos. Because he was there, because he was consistently reporting on water and these issues, he um, kind of set, helped set the tone in the community, and he helped change the ethos that now has Albuquerque today using half the water per person that it did in the 1990s. And that's a, that's a really important part of this. Um, like so many other things, like Paolo mentioned last night, um, civil rights changes, gay rights changes. It only changes once the community kind of flips. And, and courts will often follow the community, too. A lot of people had. Uh, Pat Mulroy the other day at the other water meeting said the, the law of the Colorado River will never, ever, ever, ever change. That's not necessarily true. And people would have said that in the early years of civil rights, in the early years of gay rights. And these, the courts do some, sometimes follow the community. And local journalism is important to inspiring changes in community. Sorry for that ramble, Tom. No. <laughs> well, yeah, tell us what have you. Um, there we go. Um, oh, I, I'm sorry that I'm going to be the curmudgeon, but <laughs> and the, yeah, the local journalism is really important. And when I got to Boulder, um, which yeah, there's no place in the world that has a greater concentration of environmental science and research going on. There may be other places that are equal, but no place more so. There was at least one person covering environment. There were other people who covered it on, you know, even, you know, um, on a part-time basis at the Boulder Daily Camera. Um, now there's nobody covering it. Uh, Boulder Daily Camera used to be right downtown. It now, you know, is out in some like little, you know, uh, well east of town, uh, and um, and so there's all this amazing stuff that that used to get covered on a daily basis that's no longer getting covered in Boulder, Colorado. It's astonishing. Um, and then I just also wanted to um, uh, share something from a, a former student who many many here know her name, Gloria Dickey, who's. Uh, 
a board member from the Society of Environmental Journalists, an extremely um, successful young journalist. In 2018, she published 13 features in 24 news stories in national and international magazines and online publications. She wrote one book proposal, which is successful. Yay, Gloria, so maybe things will work out. Here's what she said on Twitter recently. Um, it's tax season, which means taking stock of how depressingly little money we made last year. In 2018, I made and lift off of 14,000 US dollars in profit. I had no partner, no family support, no savings. How did I do it? One, no kids. Two, no car. Three, Canadian health insurance. Four, homelessness. I couldn't afford to pay year-round rent, so I moved between subleases, traveling, and renting a room from journalist friends. I finished the year with no debt, but no savings. Um, and she goes on to say that, um, you know, this is why so many people um, refer to journalism now as a hobby of the elite. Now, I agree with Laura. I mean, there's just incredible work, and there's all this new stuff bubbling up, and we're starting the water desk, and we've got all these other great things that are supported by foundations. But we can't forget that things are really not great out there right yeah. now. And that's that. all I wanted to say. <laughs> you're not a curmudgeon. You're a truth teller. It's all good. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And we've got like uh, you, and then we're going to like wrap right. up. I, I want to add something to this, this particular point, which is that all these foundation grants are wonderful, and things like ProPublic are wonderful, but they're not a, subst they're not a replacement for having a full-time reporter who's got a guaranteed secure job year after year after year, because if you're doing grants, you're like another nonprofit, you know, like an environmental group having to get funded every year. And that's not the same as if you have advertisers or somebody else supporting you, right. you know, without having to please a foundation. Well, yeah. Maya, Maya, as a former publisher, could yeah. you um, talk about Tom's statement? Because it really is so key. Right. You know, I mean, the, I am not saying that the uh, foundation support is the answer to it. I'm, I just found it to be a blessing because otherwise we were really screwed. Um, and it's really tough. So I want, to, I want to acknowledge that. It's a really, really tough environment, the newsrooms. I was a journalist for most of my career before I was on the dark side of the business. Um, and so I, I celebrate those uh, grants because they, were a, they are a creative way for us to get at things that are so important and that mm -hmm. we work so hard to protect in the newsrooms, um, for the newsrooms. And so those are, um, and without them, uh, it would be a lot harder to have people like Ian doing the work that he's doing that's so important. So I, I talk about it in those terms, but not as a, a solution for what's happened. One of the things about the Pulliam Grant and the ACF Grant um, is that they, those organizations found them to be a very efficient way to get at something. It's much cheaper for them to do it that way than to advertise, frankly. And I think that's one thing to think about, too. Um, you could not get the kind of coverage, you could not get the kind of um, visibility, both for the foundation and for the topic area, with the kind of money that they invested. And you know, that's just as a publisher, like, it sounds crass, but it's true. It's a very, effect a very effective, very efficient, very inexpensive way to get really high quality work done. Um, and that's how I've pitched you know, additional grants and, um, for other kinds of coverage. Um, but no, it is, it's, a, it's a terrible crisis, and, and part of what we're doing here, and you know, I, so I don't want to end on the curmudgeon point um, of dark tragedy, um, and I like the Laura point of um, you all are super sexy and what you do is really important, so <laughs> like, let's, go, let's go with that. But the, the truth of the matter is it is really difficult, um, and I want to and say thank you to you and thank you to the panelists, and if each of you have a, a final point of um, anything you would like to make. Um, you're like just thank you go team thank you yeah Elizabeth yeah, yeah. yeah I want to say go team thank you it's the it's the um, <laughs> the um, what is the word I'm looking for but it's the um, the drive that you all have for finding good stories that allows us as editors and magazines to say oh here's a wonderful one we'd like to take mm -hmm. um, as a magazine, we're probably, you know, the whole magazine community, I'm not as familiar with the newspaper community, but we're trying to, you know, wrestle with, was it a mistake to have relied so much on advertisers for our news and to have devalued the, the consumer, you know, yes. paying subscriptions and, yes, and, and just valuing news yes. and good writing. Um, I think it'll probably be a little bit of a journey to get to that point where we're 
you know, just like public school teachers, you know, really paid for the level of of dedication and um, and ingenuity and talent that that all of the local journalists have. But thank you, because those of us at magazines are are really um, inspired and getting ideas from you directly and also from your work. So thank you. I'll say thank you too. And I forgot I forgot to um, mention one of my pet peeves that I saw so many of when I got here, which was all of your euphemisms um, for talking about the Colorado River. So don't say structural deficit. Try to come up with a, with a better term. Um, that's, that's, that's one thing I wanted to mention. Um, just keep being truth tellers. And part of that is cutting through um, some of the bureaucracy that we heard a lot about over the past couple of days and coming up with our um, straightforward ways of talking about things. So thank you again for having us. It's been really, it's been really great. And what you do is life-giving. So thank you for helping give life to the desert and to the communities that you serve. So thank you all for being here. And thank you all for helping participate. Thanks, man. Yeah.